this is a big crowd. Thank you so much for all coming, you guys. It's really amazing. Oh my God, thank you for having us. It's a remarkable episode. Uh, we all remember watching it at the time, and seeing it now, it's, it just only magnifies its grandeur. Here on the 25th anniversary of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, ladies and gentlemen. It means we're old. And some people have heroin, I have Star Trek. And uh, it was just the thing I've been waiting for my whole life. I started recording the episodes on Reel to Reel tape, and in case they never aired again, and my heroes were not the actors, they were the writers. So I made note of Harlan Ellison, DC Fontana, Ted Sturgeon, all these wonderful writers. And as soon as I was, thank you, yes, please. And uh, as soon as I was a teenager, I started going to science fiction conventions and meeting them. And they became friends and mentors. And so Ted Sturgeon was my mentor when I was a teenager. And he wrote Amok Time and Shore Leave. But I also knew that he was writing for Galaxy and Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction and Astounding and all these great pulp magazines in the 50s. And when I knew him, he would go to conventions and he would be like a god, but in his private life, in his personal life, he was impoverished. And he wasn't even living in an apartment, he was living in a converted laundry room in Silver Lake. And I thought I wanted to pay homage to the writers who we wouldn't have a Star Trek or a Star Wars if not for those guys who were writing for the love of it for a penny a word or five cents a word and, and they were our, where we came from. And I wanted to honor that and show that world and talk about why science fiction was important and why speaking our truth was important. And so I came up with this idea. Now, it's interesting because when you're a freelancer, there's, it's a very different world than being on staff because I've been on both on staff and on freelance. And so I came up with this idea. I knew I wanted it to be about our Deep Space Nine characters in the 1950s in a science fiction, a magazine world of science fiction and, and have all of our actors previously, we'd only seen them in makeup like Armin and so forth, we'd see their real faces. But the rationale for why that would work, you cannot as a freelancer go in and say, well, it's just a dream, it's just a hallucination. They'll, they'll tase you and throw you to the street. So I, I worked up a rationale for why that was happening that was a little ornate, and I didn't really like it. But I went in and pitched to Hans Beimler, who had been my boss on Beyond Reality, a show I story edited, and it wasn't, it wasn't an immediate sale, uh, as opposed to First Contact, which I did for Next Gen. And, um, so a year goes by, and Hans calls me and he says, I have great news, we're buying Far Beyond the Stars. And I say, great timing, Hans, because I was working as a writer-producer on Sliders at Universal at the time, and I was writing two episodes back to back. So the only time I could break away was during my lunch hour, so I met the entire writing staff at Nicodell's, which was a restaurant next to Paramount, and they knew I was the writer of the Twilight Zone Companion, and we were all huge fans of the Twilight Zone, and, and everyone was there, I guess Ron and Uira and everybody, uh, all around the table. and. And I remember, I think it was Ron said, um, we really want to do this like a Twilight Zone. We really wanted to have that Twilight Zone feel. And so I think it was you, Ira, who said, well, let's make it from the prophets. Let's make it a vision from the prophets. And within the hour, we all kind of came up with that story and we all knew it was going to be great. Because here's, here's one thing about what differentiates a bad showrunner from a great showrunner. A bad showrunner will take a story and move it toward cliche and safety. A great showrunner, and I think Ira is one of the great showrunners, will move it toward, toward the end. We'll move it toward profound truth and risk. And so, so we became, we started talking about making it overtly about race and overtly about writing the truth. Now one thing I hadn't mentioned was that I'd heard a cassette tape of, another friend and mentor was Harlan Ellison, dearly missed, and he had done a tape about writing in the 50s and he talked about in those days when he was in New York, they would get the cover painted first and then he would run to the office of the magazine editor and, and soliloquize, rhapsodize about the cover so it was the greatest thing ever done and then he'd get the assignment to write the story based on the cover and he, he said the worst one ever that he had to talk about as if it was the Mona Lisa was a painting of a woman sunbathing on a New York tenement rooftop and a giant grasshopper was looking over the lip of the building at her and, and I actually have a copy of that, that magazine now and so, so that sort of kind of got all these pieces going in my head and so when we were all around that table at Nicodell's working up the story, we all knew it was going to be a classic, we all, all knew it was going to be great, and, um, and that was also when the idea of having Avery Brooks direct it, you, you, you had made that suggestion, Ira. And so then I went back and wrote the outline that weekend at my office at Universal, and it followed the structure of what you've just seen. The main difference is where I had Worf as a boxer rather than a, a baseball player and he gets beaten to a pulp by cops who find out he's got a, a white girlfriend, a la The Great White Hope. And the ending, in my version, the Armin character um, 
managed to get them to publish the story, and so the, so the truth gets out. And, um, and then I also had Armin as the publisher, like Horace Gold of Galaxy, and you ultimately switched around, and, and Rene was playing the firebrand, you know, former communist, and you made it, you know, um, Rene as sort of like a John W. Campbell kind of guy from Astounding, and Armin as the writer. So, but, but we knew it was gonna be great, but then, so I expected fully to write the script, and then you called me, Ira, or Hans called me and said you were gonna do it in-house, that you and he were gonna write the script, and I called you. And I remember this very vividly because I said, I really want to write that script. We all knew it was going to be a classic. And you said, if you quit your job at Sliders, I will give you the assignment. And I actually considered it because I knew this was going to be a landmark. But I was writing two episodes back to back and I could not let Sliders down. So ironically, when the episode was finally filmed, uh, I went on set to get a photo with the cast. And at the same time, that same week, they were filming a Sliders episode of mine called World Nothing to Us, called uh, Slide Cage. And I'd written a role for Armin in that episode in which he talks about his favorite TV show is Beauty and the Beast, not the Disney one, the Ron Perlman one, because we both worked on that show and he played Pascal. And he wasn't available because he was doing my DS9 episodes. So if you ever watch that Sliders episode, a different actor says that line and it makes no sense. Okay, let, let me let me shut you down there because we're, we're, we're real tight on time. I want to take it back to Ira. And Ira, now you're, you have this outline. How do you now uh, finish off the story into a teleplay with Hans? And again, was uh, Robert Wolf involved? And how do you now uh, implement and, and make the story go forward well, into a film piece? To be as brief as possible. Um, that is almost the way it happened. Um, <laughs> what happened was, uh, in my recollection, was that Mark pitched a story about Jake Sisko getting involved with a bunch of writers from the 50s, and it was a bunch of aliens who were looking down to see how that all went, and we passed on it, and about a year later, while driving to work, I got the idea of dealing with the racism issue. And it was the racism that got me interested in doing the story. So then we did something that I don't usually do, but I did know Mark. So I said, okay, instead of just taking it from him like we've done in the past, and just paying either for the story or for the idea, we brought him in and we pitched the idea to the freelancer, which had never happened before or since. And Mark went off and wrote the story. I think I remember the uh, asking you if you would quit sliders. But we just knew it was going to be an important show and we wanted to, uh, to write it because with Avery directing it, we didn't have time to really let a freelancer um, take a pass. But uh, it was an incredible two weeks with Avery. I mean, Avery was never as involved with an episode as he was with this one. And looking at it now and watching him is, uh, I wish he was here. That's all I can say. Yeah, it's a tour de force for Avery, both in terms of directing and acting. Uh, can you, uh, Ira, can you summarize the core goals of the episode? for us, please. Meaning what? Well, what are the uh, core points that you're trying to drive across through the episode? I mean, I think I know them, but I'd like you to just kind of put them into words. Well, I mean, on one level, it's a story about, you know, how screwed up things were in, the, in America in the 50s, and kind of now, uh, race and the other. Uh, but also it's about the dreamer in the dream and who's dreaming and what they're dreaming about. So, um, you know, I will say I did pitch to Rick Berman the idea that the final episode of the series was going to end up with Benny Russell. <laughs> um, on the sound stages on uh, stage 17 at Paramount, uh, wandering around the sound stages, realizing that this whole construct, this whole series that we've done for seven years was just in Benny's head. <laughs> That's how I wanted to end the series. And Rick said, 
Does this mean the original series was in Benny's head? Does this mean Voyager is in Benny's head? I said, hey man, I don't care what, who's dreaming those shows. I only care about Deep Space Nine. And yes, Benny Russell is dreaming Deep Space Nine. He didn't go for it. Uh, two things I want to point out about the episode. First of all, the huge production scale of it. The, the, the lot, the standing sets, the extras, the sumptuous cars. I mean, was, do you plan to have a production that expensive or do you allocate a certain amount of money? Because it seems as if you spent all sorts of money on the episode. Um, we spent money on it, uh, for sure. Uh, but we didn't have to pay for makeup. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We saved some money too. Um, but yeah, it did look good. I was amazed just now watching it, how good it looked. I do seem to remember, and I'd like, you know, Renee and everyone to comment on it. People seem to be in a, in a pretty good mood during the making of it. People were glad not to be in the makeup playing something else. I thought people were having fun. I did stay. One of the things I rarely had an opportunity to do was to kind of come down to the set. I remember sitting with this man in the middle of the night watching the big scene, um, one of the big scenes with uh, Avery and Penny. And, uh, you know, to me, this was my trials and tribulations. When we did Trials and Tribulations, everyone was having a blast, and I was the one who kept saying, you know, we have to do a show next week as well, so it's good to do this homage, but, you know, we have to keep going. To me, this show was kind of special, and, uh, you know, my wife can talk about having calls from Avery every night, <laughs> which uh, was kind of fun. But uh, I'd like to hear from these guys. We, we, we've got questions for each of them. The one last thing before I move on from you is that uh, jazz, jazz seems to be the musical backdrop of the episode. Was there a conscious decision made on your part, or did, uh, did Dennis uh, completely come up with that, or was Avery, because we know Avery is a big jazz guy, jazz seems to be the musical milieu of the episode. Well, I think, yes. I, I mean, I give all props to uh, Avery uh, for everything, the look, the books, you know, he was really involved. But I mean, it was a no-brainer. It's New York in the 50s in Harlem. They were listening to jazz. <laughs> jazz was the music of the streets. And uh, so it was, again, it was a good thing to, uh, to bring in a little different spice, a little different sound. All right, thank you, Ira. Ira Stephen Bear, everybody. Your esteemed showrunner. We're going to uh, turn this over to Sirach right now. Sirach, great to see you again, brother. Good to see you. And uh, Sirach, you have a, a, a wonderful and tragic character in the episode, Jimmy the Hustler. Talk a little bit about how they approached you about the character and your character arc over the course of the uh, episode. It's pretty, it's pretty sad, actually, pretty tragic. <clears throat> Yeah, what happens to him in the episode is tragic, and it also speaks to um, what happens, uh, you know, in in reality, society. You know, in society yeah. today, and we have these, uh, you know, incidents in which people are, uh, you know, brutally um, beat down in the streets, sometimes killed, you know, shot. And it's, well, and they're forced into decisions because of the social situation. Sure, and there's a lot of things that are at play as far as, you know, uh, judgment and discrimination and the same kind of elements that we were touching on in the show. And I think that it's important to, to highlight these things, and I believe that this is the first show to do so, to talk about something that is still, um, uh, you know, relevant today as far as the discussion and the narrative of what's happening you know in society so i think we still haven't really fully overcome and addressed the problems that are underlying for those things to happen um how they approached me you know i i was just uh i was happy to have that that smooth hair with that that little mustache you had a good look you know with my hat a little bit backwards and i thought that was cool so i i enjoyed that um so, but I also do want to give, uh, you know, um, a special thanks to Avery for bringing his vision, you know, to that project because there wasn't electricity 
on the set when we were filming. I, re I remember other people coming from other places around Paramount lot to come visit and watch the filming when we were doing the back lot shots. So it was an energy on the set. And, um, you know, the hair, makeup, everybody was wardrobe, costume, everybody was worried, you know, on their job. And, and I, th I felt like it was a good collective effort. Um, but I also want to say thank you to all of you who have received the show and are here and supportive throughout the years, been fans of the show, and it's that kind of a love that's kept it alive and, and kept it relevant to this day, so thank you. One thing I want to say is that uh, the, the relationship between you and Avery, the love that's there is so apparent and so genuine that, and I love how uh, the character of, of uh, Benny and Jimmy Benny is, feels very paternal towards Jimmy in the episode just as uh, Cisco does for his son. And that, uh, that juxtaposition and the fact that you two really do love each other uh, comes, comes out in the portrayal and the performance. That translates right through. Yeah, that, that's real. That's just a real thing that we have, just like Aaron and I have a real thing. What, what we do is real and how we feel is real. But to be able to, you know, translate it onto film is, is, is where, you know, the magic of it. Um, so the, the relationship with Avery is a, is a natural, real love that I have, a real bond that we share. But I will also like to add, because I may not have the chance to, um, give you a little insight from my personal uh, discussion with Avery about this episode. And one of the things that I recall him telling me, because I, you know, I've asked him about the preparation of directing the episode and, you know, how he felt about it. But I thought it was important to say this, and that is, a lot of thought went into that episode on his part as well. So, for example, the hat that he's wearing was something that reminded him of a period of time that he purposely went through, I mean, that he personally experienced. The hat that he chose for me to wear was also somebody that he knows who wore a hat like that. He knows the name of the kind of hat, and I don't want to mess it up, but he names the hats specifically. He also names parts of the set that are in Benny Russell's quarters that he had um, drawn up for the episode. The books that are on the shelves in Benny Russell's apartment were strategically placed and have purpose and meaning behind them. So if you watch the episode again and were to go into slow motion and observe the things that are in his place, the artwork, the books, even the door, for example, is a door that is made by the Dogon tribe in Africa, and that's a door that he wanted to have on the set. So, there's also very hidden subliminal messages inside of that episode, a lot of treasure. We can feel his imprimatur visually throughout the episode in so many places. Absolutely, yeah. the books, as I say, are specific books that he wanted to leave behind in the record that he wants people to read. So right. So there's, there's a lot of subtle uh, touches of Avery that are all over that uh, episode, and I think uh, many of you would be interested to, to look at it and, and, and appreciate it. Anyway, it's a great character and a great performance by you in the episode. Ciroc, so everybody. It's, it's a tragic character. I'm going to get on, move on to Aaron Eisenberg. Let's say hi to Aaron, everybody. Uh, how do you approach that? Well, to be honest, I was really terrified because I wanted to do a New, a New York accent. And my fiance always tells me I'm awful at accents. I have a horrible British accent. So back then I was really nervous that Avery would be like, look man, this isn't working. Can you, can you do this again? And luckily he didn't. And everything went really well and the scene went really well and I had a lot of fun doing it. And to be honest, I was really blessed to, to be given that little role. I wanted to, to, to do something out of makeup. I thought my, check, my paycheck might be bumped a little because we weren't in makeup. Uh, but that didn't happen, unfortunately. Uh, but truthfully, to be included with every episode was an honor. I mean, it, just in the show in general was an honor, but I was really blessed to be let to, uh, allowed to be on the show, this episode, out of makeup, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, and how did you feel to be liberated from that makeup? Well, I mean, it was great. It, it, it was different because then it, it's, it's no longer Nog. Um, 
But the truth is I, I love the makeup because that's Nog. Uh, so I don't have a problem with the makeup because once everything's on and the teeth pop in, there he is. And, and I absolutely love the character. So I don't mind playing in makeup at all. But it was really great to, to do an episode out of makeup. And I was uh, thankful that you put me in. So thank you. He's a great character. Let's hear for Aaron. Thank you. Thanks. He, he really was. Okay. I want to uh, turn my attention to our good buddies Jeff Combs and Mark Alimo. Let's have a nice hand to them. You know, they're both sweet, lovable guys in real life. I mean, they're very loving and affectionate, but they play real bastards in the episode. Uh, tell us, uh, this could be a discussion between you guys and Ur if, if he wants to get in on it. I mean, you're, the whole uh, synthesis of these characters and what they represented to the show and the culture of the times. Well, I know that Mark was not that happy about doing that role, being the guy who was going to beat up. They were, they were mean dudes. No, I, uh... I did. I had second thoughts about it. Uh, here I was, um, playing a racist, <laughs> beating up a guy that I really love. Uh, but that's why I'm an actor. Uh, but I loved being there that 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 night shoot because the ambiance was all about the '50s, and I was a kid in the '50s. And the fashion, the dresses, the clothes that the women wore, and the hairdos, and the, the cars. The cars were amazing. So it was all very exciting. Uh, Getting a Mickey Spillane kind of vibe, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was great. It was really great. But we both felt the same way. I think you felt the same way about yeah. kicking the shit out of Avery. We, we don't want to beat up Avery. We loved Avery, but, you know, we are playing intolerant bastards right. and uh, and people in authority just like actually an echo of who we are in makeup uh, so you know it's a note that had to be played i remember that night hanging with ira in that magical middle of the night with all of that going on I, listen this is what i can't get out of my head i watched this episode backstage just now and i, I was just completely floored by Avery's performance, especially that monologue. Now, I, I, I want you to just think about all of the things that Avery had on his plate as a director. That monologue is one shot, and it is beautiful and heartbreaking. It just brings you to tears. He had to do it twice? Oh, don't you love that? that Cut, print, no way, we had a problem with sound. Can you do it again? You know, I mean, it's genius. You can't, you can't, you can pop a magazine, but you cannot destroy an idea. My God. Um, it's brevure. And although I don't think we see it on a camera, the inference is that the two cops are the ones that shoot Jimmy the Hustler. Can I assume that? You can assume away. Yeah. You know. And then uh, poor Benny shows up, horrified, and then you beat the crap out of him. It's, it's a tragic, horrible moment. Tragic on top of a tragedy. You know. But a great job from you guys. So let's give him a nice hand for that. They had their role and they played it. They played it well. Great job. But at least we didn't shoot him in the back while he was running away. Okay. Uh, let's turn our attention to Mr. J.G. Hertzler over there. Hey. J.G. Uh, first of all, uh, it's, it's great to see you out of makeup, and we love you in makeup, but uh, your character, Roy Rittenhouse, was a pulp fiction artist, which is really kind of cool because those pulp sci-fi magazines of the 40s and 50s were partly defined by the incredible artwork that they had in them. So it's kind of a cool character to play. Well, of course, the 50s was well before my time. Uh, but I, uh, you know, I found out what Avery said um, was that, he, uh, you know, my hair's white, and it was white uh, during that show, but they uh, tinted it, made everything dark brown or reddish brown. And I, when I first walked out to the set, Avery said, oh, what have they done? What have they done? 
I, I wanted that shocking white hair. I said, well, I, I think I love you, Avery. I, <laughs> I could keep my hair. But that's why I had the dark hair. But I also had a question about that cowboy shirt. Uh, I mean, it sounds like I was wearing a cowboy shirt, and I saw the episode a couple of weeks ago, and I said, what the hell was I wearing that cowboy shirt for? Um, because of the Rittenhouse aspect, I'm sure. But I just want to say one thing, then I'll uh, get, get it, give up the mic. This show and this show alone stands out to me as the basis for an entire series that should be happening. It is, takes place in the 50s in New York City. That's exciting. It can go to the future wherever it wants to go. That's exciting. It can deal with any subject that it would want to deal with, and that's exciting. So please use this show as the basis for a series. And cast me. There you go. All right, thank you, JG. We turn our attention to the lovely and talented Terry Farrell. Terry. Approached her. Oh my goodness. Well, first of all, I was very nervous about doing an accent myself. So I, I feel you, Aaron. But I felt like um, Avery made me feel like I could be brave enough to do it. And I was really excited playing the stereotype of being Armin's secretary. <laughs> you know, I was so much taller than him. And, you know, it just sort of... Uh, Maybe think of the producers and that kind of thing. But what I liked the most about doing that episode, um, it felt like we were doing a play. That's how Avery made it feel on the set, to me anyway. I brought pictures from home to decorate my desk and, um, you know, to make my space my own, like I was really his secretary. And um, it, it was so much fun to do something so completely different. And even though it was small, it was juicy and full of life for me. And just honored to be a part of such a big story. So sad that it's so relevant today. Yeah, a little bit too relevant. Uh, one thing I loved about the character was, I think she's a bit of a sci-fi fan because she read Benny's story and she loved it. She didn't have any reservations about it. And there was this kind of an innocence to the fact that she was attracted to the story that I thought was really nice and sort of neat. It's like, hey, this is a really good story and I'm not, I'm not really biased. I'm a sci-fi fan and I dig it. Right, right, yeah. I got lucky. <laughs> okay, well thank you, Terry. Thank you. Which brings us to Mr. René Aubergenois. All right, so he's a, uh, He's an irritating, uh, a, a wonderful character, but an irritating character. Uh, Editor Douglas Past. Wait, 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 wait. Irritated or irritating? Both. Yeah. Um, I'll second. There's a few different things that are going on. First of all, there's a, there's a kind of a B story uh, between him arguing with uh, a character, Herb Rossoff, played by uh, Armin, and you've almost got the same Odo Quark dynamic going on again all over again here in the uh, writer's pool. So that's funny, you two were playing off each other on that, right? Well, yeah, we played off each other as actors, and um, we have a history of playing off each other, and so I didn't think of him as Quark, I didn't think of myself as anything like Odo. Um, uh, the bickering but, between the two is clearly more than a coincidental juxtaposition, though. Um, yeah, I guess so. I don't know. I, I just did it. Mine is not to question why. I, all I remember, well, I remember a lot about that, but I remember Ira coming and saying, so, uh, you know, this guy is not, not a nice guy. <laughs> Are you going to be, he was, I think he was worried that I was going to be pissy about, oh shit, I have to play a bad guy. And of course, that's what I do for a living a lot of times, you know, I'm, Oh no, wasn't a bad guy, but a lot of characters I've played are bad guys. I just want to say about being in it and then, uh, you know, to, to see it and see bits and pieces of it. Um, and uh, the things that pop out at me is Avery's incredible passion. And, you know, every time a director comes, they have a real, you know, they want it to be the best thing. And, but. Avery had invested so much of himself into this, and uh, so it was great to work with him. And then standing back there, I went, oh God, 
Rock Peters. Yep. Oh yes. my God. Legendary. I, I, um, this is geezer talk, but when I was a very young actor, I played Rodrigo in Othello, and which he played a brilliant Othello. So there you go. Anyway, that's oh, you know. Thank you, Renee. Renee Rene 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 Very good. Uh, that takes me over to Armin Sherman. He's down there somewhere. He's a short-tempered liberal writer. Would that be a fair description? Very fair. Uh, tell us about uh, how you were pitched the character and how you approached uh, creating the character. Um, as Mark told you, um, I originally thought I was going to play Renee's character and very happy to have played Herb instead. Uh, forgive me, I'll ask the writers. I I'm assuming uh, Herb has a lot to do with uh, Harlan Ellison. Yes, yeah. Uh, Harlan Ellison was uh, described to me the same way Adam, you just described her. So um, it, it was a, it was a delight. Um, Avery and I, 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 I want to second, third, fourth, fifth uh, Avery's commitment to this episode. Not only as a director, which was beyond beyond, but also his work as an actor. Uh, I don't think I'm insulting him by saying that some of the finest work Avery ever did on our show is in that episode. Uh, we, I remember we had one slight contretemps, which is that, uh, in reference, uh, Adam, to something you said to Rene, I, I don't think it was about the, the our relationship, Rene's in mind, but he said, well, you, you got to approach this the way Quark does, and I, and I said, no, I've spoken to Mark about this, and Herb has nothing to do with Quark. I, I play Quark. And that synergism will be there because I'm the same actor. But, but Herb is not Quark, and, and I don't have to have the same qualities as Quark. Uh, and he heard that, and I, it's a tribute to Avery. He heard it and said, okay, okay. It was not, what he, it was not his first intention, but he listened to me and uh, he went with that. Um, it, it, was a, it was splendid to play something other than Quark, not that I don't like Quark, but it was splendid to do something else. It was splendid to see all of you as other characters. You too. <laughs> Even you. Uh, it, it was like being on another show and, and seeing all your, having all your friends around you as you were doing the show. It, it, was, it was just a delight. The great thing about science fiction is that it allows it allows you to take social issues, put them in a different prism, and you can appreciate the issues being talked about without being slapped in the face. Uh, that's the great one of the great things about science fiction. And Star Trek always did that, but I think this episode is one of the premier episodes of all time of Star Trek. Thank you, Arnold. Okay, I have one last thing to say, I, I, only because I think it's so charming. Um, uh, the Akutas uh, used to put little things, notes, uh, around on the set. And on, on Herb's desk, there was a little note from one of the Akutas that it's, it was written to my character, Herb, and I've never forgotten it, because it, it, when I saw it, and just by accident I saw it on my desk, it said, Herb, the idea of having a cheerleader be a vampire slayer won't work at all. <laughs> Was my little, uh, uh, such a wonderful in joke between the Akutas and me. This is the first time I think I've ever shared it, so thank you. And although we haven't really said it, I mean, it's sort of the obvious is that the episode is also a loving homage to sci fi writers and to the tradition of sci fi writing as it arose out of the pulps of the 40s and 50s and now onwards into uh, television and other media. But there is definitely something. Uh, loving about it, the way that it presents these uh, this group of writers in the uh, what was it, the Trill Building? I believe it was uh, the location of it, as i.e. the Brill Building. Um, but that I want to uh, get to Nana, Nana visitor, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll just uh, bring Ira into this just a little bit. Casey Cunt, uh, Casey Hunter, her character, uh, was modeled maybe after DC Fontana. Is that what I heard? Something like that, or? Um. Maybe a little. Uh, 
and, and I also I should mention that in that regard, there was a husband and wife team, Henry Cutner and C.L. Moore. Yes. Uh, 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 Sadiq's uh, character. It was, it was based on C.L. Moore. That, that was the whole, yeah. And uh, so Nana, I mean, uh, this, she, she's a wonderful character for a few reasons. First of all, she's very sympathetic to Benny and loving, and, and he needed that loving and nurturing. But also, she's rightly pissed off about the fact that she is a woman sci-fi writer, and she's, as usual for the 50s, a, another woman with incredible talent being marginalized by the male establishment. And that's an important role to play. Yeah, yes. Uh, first of all, I, I just want to briefly say happy anniversary of 25 years of this relationship and this relationship. Yay! It's been amazing. And in, in, terms, of, um, in terms of my character, yeah, uh, and there's a pulled back quality that um, there was a wonderful character actress named Eve Arden. Um, and I very much looked at the way she worked, because she played smart women in the 50s, and there was an element of be smart, but not too smart. Don't, don't, you know, don't take too much attention, don't be too female, just get in there and get out so that you can get your agenda pushed. And I was very aware of doing that. The other thing I think of that character is uh, there's a picture of my in the 50s like this, and she had that hairstyle that I had, and I look exactly like her. And she was my age that I was when we filmed that uh, in the 50s. And I do that in the, at, at one point to just remember, yeah, it was an homage to my mother. I look just like her. So it was between my mother and uh, what women did, what women had to do and the, and the the line, that the very careful line they had to walk in order to be smart, but not too smart. Uh, it's a chilling uh, comparison to my own mom, who was a radio journalist in the 40s and a Madison Avenue uh, advertising writer in the 50s. And she also had to keep uh, under the radar and a low profile and could uh, sometimes uh, actually represented herself as a man in order to get her, her work sold. So. Uh, it, the, the, the story just points out that we not only have a, uh, an ethnicity bias, but a gender bias that sadly is even still going on today. I mean, like, the episode is maybe a little too prescient, and unfortunately we haven't uh, learned all the lessons that we should have. But she was a wonderful character, so thank you for that. Okay, I've tried to leave a good time for audience questions. Did, we get, did I get through everybody? All right, well, just, uh, we're gonna, we'll probably close out with a couple of final statements just towards the end, but let's do get to some questions. We'll start over there, so here we go. Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you for the whole crew. Absolutely great crew, fantastic. But I have a very short statement, wish, and then a question for Magnificent Mark Alimov. Uh, first of all, the statement is on behalf of the, uh, a popular uh, Facebook group called um, uh, Mark Alimov, the real Gal Ducat, to tell you on behalf of the whole uh, 160 members that we all love you very much for creating this complex, brilliantly acted, uh, and attractive hero of ours, Gal Dukat. And then... <laughs> the wish is that we hope to see you more often in uh, Europe, and we hope to see you in London for the documentary premiere of DS9. Uh, that's the wish, and uh, the question is whether you have some, um, or you had some uh, wishes in the past that uh, there was a uh, deeper line, storyline for Gal Ducat that didn't happen. For instance, for us, it would be very interesting to see Ducat as a pirate more. And uh, what do you think about it? So what would be uh, the, a, a storyline that is missing from the classical DS9? <laughs> um, well, he was sort of a pirate. In space. Uh, all I could say about that, um, 
There are a couple of things it would have been nice to be able to develop with that character, but I think 90% of, of what happened with him was, was very satisfying to me. It, it's one of the best experiences of a, of a very long career playing that character because he was so consistent and because the writers and producers gave me so much leeway and allowed me to make him multi-dimensional, which I really love them for. And it let me flex my, my um, creative muscles. And I'm very proud of him and I'm very proud that you folks out there liked him so much. Uh, liked him and hated him, let's put it that way. The thing I loved most is that one week you could hate him, the next week you would love him. And that, that's how I feel about it. Really? Yeah. Thank I don't you like you, guy. Thank you very much. Let's, uh, let's move it over to here. Uh-huh. Here we go. Yes. Hi. This one's for the writers. With you guys being very passionate about writing, was that very important in making Jake Sisko a writer as well as having this episode where it's focused on writers? And also with that episode, is that also why later when Vic Fontaine, his holodeck program was taken over by a mob, is that why Ben Sisko was reserved in trying to help him save his holodeck program? Because he was mentioning he didn't like the racism in the era of the program. Well, that's two questions. <laughs> um, definitely with Jake, you know, one of the things we had to do, because this kid kept growing up, you know, <laughs> Sirac would not stay the same size or, or, or the same age. This guy did, but... but <laughs> So we needed to do something. We needed to give him something. We needed to mature him. And and look, you're sitting in a room a thousand hours a day talking, writing stuff. It was like, you know, none of us knew anything about life. You know, we couldn't make him a certified public accountant or a, or a doctor or anything else. We didn't know anything about that. The only thing we know is, is, is writing and creativity. We could have made him a, a movie director, but, you know, they get enough. Um, so we made him a writer. And the other thing that I do have to say, all kidding aside, is that Ciroc projects, you know, even as a kid, there was a sensitivity and an intelligence to the character that made it believable. Um, and, uh, you know, in episode one of season eight in the doc, he's still a writer, so that still works. In terms of, of uh, Bada Bing, you know, look, uh, you know, I worked with Avery for seven years, and I got to know him pretty well within the work environment. And uh, I know the strong feelings he had in terms of the history of, of race relations in the country. And, you know, yes, I, as everyone knows, and at the time everyone wished did not exist, I like Vegas and I like the history of Vegas in the 50s and 60s and the Rat Pack and all that stuff. Just the thing. But, but at that same time, it was an incredibly racist town. It was, <laughs> you know. Uh, black performers could not stay at the hotels where they performed. I mean, it was unbelievable the shit that was going on. And, you know, if we let it, it'll come back today. But that, I know there are people who hate when we get political, so forget that. But the idea is we had to at least make some note of the fact that in reality, yes, it's nice that Cisco, you know, helped you know, uh, the, 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 the Rat Pack singer, but in reality at that time, they'd be clocking him if he even walked into a casino. That's the truth. So we had to at least make mention of, of that tragic uh, time. So there you go. All right, great, great explanation, okay. 
Hello. Uh, my question is for all the great people who appeared in the episode. And I noticed that one thing I enjoyed about the episode very much was the brilliant dialogue that was written by Ira and others. And it was very different from any other DS9 episode. It flowed with a different tempo. It flowed with a different cadence. So did Avery Brooks, as a director, kind of like, was he a dialogue coach very much so when all of you were speaking your lines? Or did he let all of you as performers naturally speak your lines as you thought they might be appropriate for your characters? Take it away, <laughs> He wasn't, certainly wasn't a dialogue coach, but he certainly was a director in that he, you know, when he talked to us as actors, and being an actor himself, he, uh, he made it clear how he felt the energy or what, what the agenda was and how to drive that. And, um, and there seemed to be a, an understanding, and, in, and I can't even remember how that became part of the experience, but we all did seem to understand that it was different music we were being asked to play. And that made it very exciting. I mean, just personally for me, doing Odo for, you know, ever and ever, and then suddenly being able to talk like the pain in the ass that I am in real life was um, invigorating. And, and if I may piggyback on what Odo Renee said, uh, you're, you're used to us being the characters that, that you saw in Deep Space Nine, you're, you're looking at a stage full of phenomenally good actors. A phenomenally good actors. And so we, we were asked to play other characters other than what we were playing. So naturally, you'll have a different cadence because we are playing different characters. We're not playing the characters you're used to seeing. It's a tribute not only to the writing that they can... I mean, Terry's language would not be anywhere near Dax's. And they wrote for those characters, and, and we were competent actors who picked it up and ran with it. So, it was that. Thank you very much. All right, great. Can I, can I add to, I think he's, yes. he was really an actor's director, so he really trusted that he'd have a conversation with us, and then he trusted our, his relationship he had with us. I mean, we all know each other from just being the people that we are out of costume and as we are as actors together, just as a troop, that, which makes it different too. And you may not think of it that way because you're used to seeing us from the characters of Deep Space Nine. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we are very low on time over here. Hi, my question is directed at any or all of the cast members, if you'd like to chime in. I was just wondering, um, six, seven years is a long time to play a character. Did you ever feel like you absorbed your character's traits into your own personalities? You know, uh, during certain shows that were very intense and long, I actually, dream when I'd go to sleep, I would have Kira dreams, not Nana dreams. It was a little weird. I do feel that the character pushed me. The things I had to think about made my brain function in different synapses form than if, you know, and frankly, I was Kira for more time than I was Nana during those years. So, I, yeah, my brain started working a little differently. I would say I did, I, I did get very affected by Kira. And sometimes she acted like she was a major, even when she wasn't in costume. <laughs> so good. I remember you telling me, this is fake, when I was so happy to sit in the captain's chair. <laughs> I really love those days. Go, no, no, you know this is not real. <gasps> but, but you did it so well. I loved it. Uh, anybody else want to chime in about that? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, we'll we're so close to the end here, I just think it behooves us to see if there's any closing statements anybody wants to make, not only on this groundbreaking episode, but as we conclude our week-long uh, anniversary celebration for the 20th anniversary of our beloved show. Uh, any, any final closing comments and benedictions? I, 
Nanan, 20 years ago, I told you. 20 years ago, I told you. He told me I can go right back to that moment. You say. I said, we were sitting backstage and, and, and uh, we weren't getting the appreciation that TNG was. And I said, wait, wait 20 years. Uh, and they'll, they'll come around to us. Just wait, just wait. Thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for him. Renee J.G., the